Okay, um, hello everyone. This is the uh, state of the BTS with the owner of bugs.debian.org, Don Armstrong. Yeah, so I'm actually only one of the people who is owner at. Um, so um, if you want to follow along, <laughs> if you want to follow along, um, the slides for this presentation are not very informative, but they're available on rzlab.ucr.edu slash Debian slash DC9. Um, and so there's two talks there. You want the one that's obviously the state of the BTS. Um, so just a brief technical overview of how Debugs work. Those of you who've seen my previous talks have already seen this diagram. So mail comes in. Um, it's despammed, and the despam process is pretty much entirely written by Blars Blarson, uh, who's in the back. He basically takes care of making sure our BTS is relatively free from spam. Um, if not for his work, we'd be totally drowning. And from that, it goes into process all. So we're actually in the process right now of taking the mail in and spam processing part and splitting it onto a separate machine from the rest of this. And that will enable us to um, scale out slightly better and make it a little bit more robust in terms of receiving mail um, so that if we start getting nailed by spammers, we can spread it over a, a larger number of hosts. Um, process all actually then takes all the despam messages and then shoves them into two different scripts depending on where it was received. Uh, one is service, which deals with all the mails that you send to control at or request at. And the other is process, which handles the mails that go to submit at and any uh, number, number, number at bugs.debian.org. So anything that you send to 12345 at bugs.debian.org or 12345-submitter, that all goes to this script. So these two scripts basically handle everything that goes to the BTS. And then it's stored in uh, db.h, which is sort of a slightly expanded flat file database. Each bug has uh, a few files located in a uh, slightly hashed directory. And from those, we build indexes, which are then used by the CGI scripts that most everybody actually interacts with directly. Um, and the CGI scripts also can read from the database itself uh, by raw. So just sort of to orient everybody um, to how it works. Um, so while that part of the diagram hasn't changed much because it's relatively sane, the actual underlying code um, that drives it has changed quite a bit in terms of its architecture. So the primary reasons that we've changed this is because, first off, the original system had a whole huge set of monolithic scripts. Um, basically, control and process were a monolithic script that included a relatively monolithic Perl uh, library, none of which was use strict or use warnings uh, able at all. Um, and this also meant that it was pretty hard to test. Um, and it also meant that changing just about anything meant that you had to keep the whole concept of what was going on in that particular script in your mind um, in order to make even a small change. So one of the things that we've done is we've abstracted the functions out um, so that we can actually start testing and maybe hopefully doing some unit testing in the future. Um, and it also, this made it really difficult for new contributors to get started. Um, so uh, hopefully the changes that I've made have or will enable some new guinea pigs to c get involved with debugs. Um, so what I've been doing most recently is uh, primarily working on modularization. And this is all sorts of changes that aren't very visible to you all. Um, but we've gone from a few Perl modules to, at current writing, 32 modules. Um, almost all of them. Um, are use warnings and use strict as any Perl program should actually be doing. Um, and I've also switched most of the code base now to using the params validate module, which uh, the useful bit about that is it enables you to use name parameters when you're doing function calls. So it, it means that the functions are relatively self-documenting. There's not a case where you have uh, to go back and look at the documentation for a function to figure out what argument number five to this function that happens to take 100 different arguments actually does. Um, it also enables you to do some pretty neat things in, uh, in Perl. Um, 
And we also now are able to write tests that test a single module or small functions in a module. We don't have to bring up an entire BTS uh, copy in order to run any tests. Um, so just I'll give you an example of a couple of things that we've modularized out. Um, uh, this has uh, a debugs common, for example. So there's a big file that's called error lib, which um, contained a whole set of functions. And these are just general functions that are included all over the BTS. Um, and we went from having uh, a huge number of package or even debugs wide global variables to almost none. Um, and there's some new routines in here that I happen to use a lot. So uh, make list is an example. For those of you who uh, deal with Perl a lot, one of the annoying things is when you pass uh, arrays or um, scalars to functions, it's nice to be able to automatically turn them into appropriate type of object along with the referencing. So this does it all for you. Um, another thing that's changed, and this is probably more interesting to most people in the room, is debug status. So when you call the SOAP interface or you use BTS status, what you're actually seeing is the output from a function in here called get bug status. Um, and so this function or the documentation of this module uh, might be of interest to you if you're using the SOAP interface because it explains a little bit and eventually it'll explain completely exactly what the SOAP interface is returning. Um, and this has everything to do with the status of the bug, including how to read and write the bugs. Um, and also how to test, for example, whether a bug is archivable. Um, and then the, the other thing that's changed massively is the way we handle configuration. So beforehand, we used to just read in uh, and require the config files. Written in Perl, it's a pretty simple way to do it. You just require it. Um, and you let this config file touch whatever it wants to. It can mess with anything it wants to. Um, the problems with this is it makes it extremely difficult to have a zero length configuration file that does anything sane. Or slightly more complicated, a relatively short configuration file which changes a couple major variables and then sets everything based on that in a sane manner. Um, so what we've done instead is we load this configuration file in a safe partition. Uh, so it's like a little code or a little subunit uh, in the Perl namespace that isn't allowed to touch anything else except for what we allow it to touch it. And then now we can um, read in the variables that are being set in this file. And then based on those variables, set all of the currently unset variables to reasonable default values based on this. So the practical upshot of this is that if, for example, you were to set the my domain name for my BTS is bugs.foo.com, for example, all the other things that depend on the domain name of your BTS automatically get set for you. So it knows the web pages at http.bugs.foo.com, the CGIs are all in this particular location, the web pages are all in this same place, the mail domain name is here, a good default value for the list domain name is on the same domain, etc. So all that happens automatically. The most important thing that this enables me to do though is it enables me to test uh, a full up BTS very, very simply. So with a four line configuration file, I can override the copy of send mail that I'm using to a local copy that all it does is take the mail, shove it into the disk. I can override the location of the spool directory, which is what has that db.h thing. And so now I can actually run an entire test uh, of a full up BTS by sending mail to it, looking at the mail that comes back out of it, uh, checking what's happened on disk, uh, all in a single make test inside of the debug source tree. Um, and so that's helped a lot. So I would have, you've probably already seen that I've broken the BTS on a number of occasions. If I didn't have this available to me, um, it would probably still be broken because I wouldn't have been able to figure out what I had done wrong. Um, so this enables me to at least stop the really hideous bugs that would totally block anybody from doing anything at all uh, on the BTS. Um, the final thing that I'm just going to talk about, there's, I'm not going to go through all 32 modules because that would be kind of dumb uh, and, and really boring. Um, the final thing I want to talk about, though, is debugs bugs. Um, and this is also an extremely useful module if you're 
uh, using the BTS command line tool, or also if you're using the package report uh, CGI. Um, this is how we actually select any bugs that are output. So if you use BTS select and you go package colon, um, I don't know, debugs, tag colon, help, for example, all of those get parsed and in, put into a SOAP request, which then gets dispatched to the get bugs function. Um, that's actually the really the only major public function that uh, debugs bugs provides. And so this function is kind of interesting. It st first starts off and it tries to send the entire request to the indices that we have. So we have a bunch of indexes that index things like packages and sources and maintainers and correspondence and some other stuff. Um, but we don't have indexes for everything. So if that particular module isn't, or function isn't able to satisfy your request because you've wanted to do something crazy, it, it gives up and kicks off control to the next one, which actually goes serially through every single bug. Uh, well, there's an index file which has a bunch of things about every single bug and goes through that file linearly trying to figure out exactly what sort of request you wanted to do. Um, so for example, if you were to search for uh, bugs and packages which have no maintainer, um, it's the second serial thing that happens. So if you ever are running a request that suddenly takes a lot longer than you would expect it to based on the number of bugs it's returning, uh, that's why. It's because you've probably triggered a request that doesn't have indexes and it's gone to the second thing. Um, and the documentation within it is pretty complete. So if you're ever at a loss for why the CGI or the SOAP routines returned a particular set of bugs, this is the module that you can look. I promise it's relatively readable. The documentation is there. So if you find yourself getting confused, check it out. Um, okay, another thing that's changed, and this is the inside mod part of it isn't very interesting for most of you, but the effects of it are extremely useful, is the fact that we've, I've now started to abstract out all the control changes. Um, and so almost every control action, and I was hoping to have totally finished, there's only the slightly more difficult cases of merging, unmerging, and cloning bugs um, that are not yet done, um, has a corresponding function in debugs control. And so what this is going to enable us to do is to do useful things like modifying all aspects of a bug at submit time. Also, perhaps sometime in the future, we'll also be able to do things using a web front end directly talking to these functions. Um, so we'll be able to modify uh, bugs in a much more elegant fashion instead of having to always send out a request to control. Um, the basic way it works, argument parsing begins a control request. Um, and all the stuff on the top is all, so steps one and two and five, six, and seven are all implemented the same way every time for every single bug request. So that means that there's no duplication of code that does this. So you'll always see the exact same header for every single bug when you uh, tell a control message to do an action on a bug. It'll always tell you what the bug number is, what the bug title is, what the package is. Um, so that's what enables us to do all this at once. And I've just lost my microphone. Am I back yet? Oh, okay then I've gone deaf already. Um, and so this enables us to make everything the same so that it's quite a bit easier uh, to update things, uh, etc. Okay, so with that, that was kind of boring. Let's talk about things that you actually care about. So one of the most important things that most people are interested in are the new features that I've added. So I, I try to work on adding new features uh, and I sort of piddled them out as, as time comes. Um, so the, the one new feature that I wanted to talk about today, I'm going to talk about a couple. The first is effects. So one of the common problems in Debian, especially if you're maintaining moderately heavily used packages by users who don't necessarily understand how the package work, i.e. probably 90% of your users, if not more, um, is that if there is a bug in, let's say, package A, maybe we'll call package A libc6, uh, which causes a problem in package B. So let's imagine that you have a bug somewhere in libc6 which causes, uh, I don't know, mm, Emacs, for example, to segfault. Okay. 
uh, or make it worse, ice weasel, okay? So, so what's going to happen is you're going to get a few thousand users telling you that yes, ice weasel is crashing. Um, and that's not entirely helpful to you because you've seen all these bugs and you know exactly why ice weasel is crashing. It's because libc6 has a bug. So you spend half your time reassigning bugs to libc6 because that's actually the package which has the bug. It just happens to be that your package is the most visible uh, package for the user. Um, and so they report the bug against your package. So what this enables you to do is you can now go and say, okay, this particular bug affects package foo. And so by default then, this particular bug, for example, if it was bug one, I would say, okay, control, affects one ice weasel. And so now by default, this bug will show up in ice weasel's bug list uh, in the default view. So the casual user as they're viewing it will at least see the bug and know that it's there. Um, you can also exclude this so that it won't show up as well. Uh, I have to add the option to do that um, so that it'll be done for people by default, but, uh, but it can be done. And so this is how you would do that. So hopefully this will reduce some of the bugs that are filed. Um, and so this is just an example to show you that it works. I have no idea why there's a black box in the upper left-hand corner. But anyway, uh, the important bit here is, so this is the uh, bugs for dev bugs. Okay, it's got version whatever it has. And this right here, which you can barely see, is a bug that's in bugs.debian.org, which I've marked as affecting dev bugs. Uh, and it's because I get this bug filed a lot that says that the CGI options are not working. Well, they actually are now, but people keep telling me about it. And so and this bug happens to be merged with a whole slew of other bugs, and, and that's where it is. So the other thing that I wanted to talk about really briefly um, was summary. So sometimes what happens is you have a really long bug thread, and the original bug report isn't particularly informative as to the actual problem. So you spend part of your time going through and figuring out what in the world the actual issue with the bug is. And hopefully at some point in time you come to the understanding that, okay, no, this is the actual problem now. Um, but unless you totally fix the bug at that point in time, um, you, if you later come back to that bug, you're always in the position of trying to figure out again, okay, at some point in this mail log, I figured out what the problem is. And so you spend a reasonable amount of time figuring out what message you deciphered that in. At least I do, because I can't remember, uh, you know, in a message, a bug log that has 40 or 50 messages, I have no idea which message I wrote that summarized it properly. So what this enables you to do is you can um, summarize a long discussion into a single paragraph. And what this enables you to do is extract the first non-control, non-pseudo-header, non-quoted paragraph from a nominated message. So uh, basically this would be, a, even if you did a reply to a message and included some control things uh, or a pseudo-header or something in the message, you would skip all those paragraphs until it got to the first bit of your reply where you would presumably go, all right, this is what your problem actually is, blah, 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 this is what needs to be fixed, period, in your paragraph. Then later in a control message, or once I fix this, in the same message, you'll just say, oh yes, this contains the summary. So the summary for message, or bug one, two, three, four, five, is in message number 30. And the message you get is straight from the CGI. So it'll show you message number whatever, you look at that message number and say, yes, that's the message number that had the summary, and this will nominate it. And so this is what this looks like. So um, I think it was message number 28 in this particular bug about, I happen to like this bug. This is my uh, bug to use for options here. So this is, again, the same bug, CGI options not working. And now there's a summary. So it's already fixed in my tree and uh, will be fixed in the BTS the next time I sync whatever the... Uh, sync them up. Okay. So this is the summary of the current state of this issue. So I don't even need to read the rest of this bug report. I can just look at this little summary bit here, and I know exactly what's going on with it. Yes, it's actually exported by get status. So if you um, are interested in getting the summary via SOAP, 
you can do it by BTS status and the bug number, and it will give you the actual text. So in the BTS, this actual text is stored in the summary status. We don't actually continue to store uh, and continuously extract which or that text from the bug message. So this is just a one-shot thing. Um, another new feature uh, that BDL actually I heard the first time about mm, in DebComp 4 or so, something like that, um, is the ability to run a local copy of Debugs. Um, and so this is something that once I fix one more bug in it, um, I'll make an upload to Experimental so you guys can in install it, uh, <laughs> that enables you to run a full local copy of Debugs. And so you can select a set of bugs that you're interested in by a configurable query. Um, you can either give it a set of bug numbers, or it has all the ability to do the standard um, select commands that you can do if you use BTS select. Um, so by default, it selects unarchived bugs, which are in packages you maintain, uh, bugs that you've corresponded with, bugs that you've submitted, or bugs which are RC. Um, and so currently it takes about two gigabytes, which is almost entirely indexes, which needs to be optimized a bit. Um, and But it'll be part of the experimental debugs package. Yeah. No, it's not. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so when I th once I have a local copy of debugs, can I manipulate it? Okay, so you can send messages, but you can't manipulate it currently on the machine itself. So it doesn't have all the stuff to do the uh, manipulation of your local copy. Okay, so you can't actually work offline on your BTS and... Uh, and see your changes. No. Or then later merge with... Well, because the way you would do your changes... <laughs> yeah. So the way you would do your changes, um, and the way I may make it work eventually, is you would do it by queuing up mail messages. So you would have your local copy, and you queue up your mail messages, and eventually they flow. That's how you would merge them with the upstream. And so then later on, you would go and say, OK, yes, update me again, and it would pull them all back. So assuming you have a laptop that can queue mails, or whatever you're using can queue mails, this will basically work. Uh, it is, though, a, a feature that I've thought about to be able to lo modify the local copy. It just It's more complicated. So uh, I haven't done that yet. Uh, but um, actually, if you, as soon as you, st as you start que uh, queuing mails, you could at the same time just write to the local copy and forget about the changes as soon as you think. So right, but the logic to do that aspect of it is what I, I haven't written. So. Yeah, of course, <laughs> understood. Um, just to show you that it's working, uh, uh, these are the commands that you would run. Um, so let me see if I can demo it here, if it'll uh, work, or if it'll explode. Uh, let's find a. Um, terminal. I have no idea if this terminal will be readable, but we'll try. Oops. Okay, can you guys kind of see that? Okay, well, the, the critical aspect is, uh, let's see, where are we? Yep. Okay, so the first thing to do is to run local debugs mirror, which will run whatever command uh, or whatever queries you had configured um, and download all the set of bugs. Um, this takes a while, so please, if you build a copy of this yourself, please don't do it here, because uh, it's a little bit suboptimal right now. Um, the next thing you do is you start the daemon. So let's see if I have it installed properly. Or maybe I already started it. Well, okay, looks like it succeeded. Um, And then we have a couple different things. Uh, the most basic stuff is to interact with the um, package report or the bug report uh, CGI. So if we want to see a particular bug, so in this case 441151, we can just go local debugs, lowercase s, 441151. It'll send a request off to Sensible Browser to look at the local um, uh, the local Perl uh, web server that's running, and if I, I don't know. 
once my machine decides to redraw my screen. Well, it's not totally working apparently, but if it was, this would show you the actual uh, request. Uh, let me see if I can fix this. had a different version installed than the one that I had in my source tree. Um, so this is a local copy running on port 8080 on localhost of dev bugs showing uh, the same bug <laughs> that we've been looking at the entire time. Um, and, and as you can tell, it has the whole thing there. So. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, everything it works just as it would normally, or it should work. If it doesn't, it's a bug that I need to fix. Um, so, so that's that. <laughs> if, for example, we wanted to see then a package which I maintain, so I happen to maintain Lily Pond, which has an interesting number of bugs. Uh, I just started, so uh, it's not entirely my fault. Um, so we do the same thing, uh, and, and these have longer. Uh, names, by the way, than just the upper and lower case S. It just happens to be what I'm showing you. So this will take a second. Um, hopefully it'll just take a second. But anyway, so this will show the package report page for, um, for Lily Pond once it figures itself out. So this is, again, also running on localhost 8080. Same thing. It looks just like a normal BTS, except it's running on localhost. Um, the port that it runs on is, of course, configurable and some other stuff you can do. It's just a standard HTTP server uh, that's it's running. So it's that Perl module that's actually doing all the work. Uh, I just sort of fork out to our CGI requests. And so these are the, the bugs there. And in theory, anyway, uh, yes, the links actually work. In theory. So, <laughs> so uh, hopefully they do. Oh, it's trying to load it. This machine's a little slow. So, yeah, there it goes. So, and uh, in theory, at least e even the version graphs work. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it, this is really a local copy. You're actually running the real code uh, that would be running on the BTS. So, this will only be in uh, experimental because, unfortunately, there are some people who are, well, or fortunately, I don't know, but they're running debugs in production, um, and I'm not yet ready to inflict the current version upon them. Um, so uh, I, I don't know whether it's, this is going to make it into a release or not anytime soon, but I'll try to make it so that's releasable. Um, so if you use this and you find bugs, or if you're a current user of debugs uh, somewhere else and you have systems that you can use it on and tell me if it's totally busted for your install, that would be useful and it helped me clue me in as to whether I can actually release this. Okay, so um, there's some issues with it. Uh, it has really suboptimal missing bug handling. It, it sort of just tells you that there's an error. It doesn't prompt you that, hey, uh, I can load this error into the list of bugs that you can look at, so the next time you sync up, I'll include it. Um, so it isn't able to do that. Um, the size of the mirror is uh, large. Um, most of that is in index files. Um, and so what I what may end up being the right approach is to not bother to sync the indexes but rebuild them. But I haven't really figured that out yet. Uh, once you actually mirror this, additionally syncing the indexes is not all that hard. I mean, it's just an R sync and there are syncable. Um, so that works pretty well. Um, but it's something that could be improved. It also could be faster to sync. Um, right now, uh, I, I figured out that running include arguments on rsync is a really bad idea, especially when I kind of know what the file names are. Um, so right now it sort of just shoves a file list of files that it should be getting at rsync, and it doesn't really distinguish between whether they're archive bugs or unarchive bugs. So rsync throws a lot of error messages uh, about <laughs> files not existing. Um, but in general, it, it does a reasonable job. So that's something that's technical that needs to be fixed about it. But it works to some degree. I have a very quick question in relation to uh, the BTS command. It has a cache. 
like DevScript's BTS cache, right. um, which basically downloads the bugs, rewrites all the URLs, and makes something similar to this working. What's the benefit of the of the whole debugs install? Well, so th the benefit here is that you have a full, fully working BTS, and so you can do uh, select queries and stuff that you couldn't do uh, easily using BTS cache. It also means that the the updates for this are much faster, uh, and it does things that it's just not possible to do in, in BTS. Like with this, you can actually download the mail logs, for example, where you could do that in BTS, but you had to know beforehand that you wanted to look at the mail logs. So uh, with this, it just works uh, basically. So I mean, BTS still has a, a use case, but it's just. Uh, Slightly changed. Does that mean that the SOAP uh, interface is also working on the local machine? Um, we could make it work. Okay. I, I don't think I have the. Uh, I, I don't think I've written it so that it knows about how to execute that CGI. It's sort of limited. It knows about the CSS, the uh, package report, the um, versions, and the bug report CGIs. But I, I could certainly. Well, you, you mentioned BTS Select. Doesn't that use the SOAP interface? Uh, yes. So but, well, so the um, yeah, I could certainly make it so that it would work properly with the with that. You would have to change, of course, the URLs, but that's configurable in BTS as well. Okay, um, a couple other tips and tricks. Um, one of them is the ability to do full text search. This has been around for a while, but I don't think enough people know about it, so I'm going to talk about it again. Um, currently, it uses Hyperstrayer. Um, I'm not certain if that's really the best way. We may have to switch to Zapien or something else. Um, but that's its URL. Uh, so an example we can do um, is we can search for LP0 on fire. Let's see, well, if I can do that. Oops. Uh, I have no idea where I did that, but anyway, I'll open up a new tab. Assuming I have network on this machine right this second, it looks like I do. Okay, so uh, this is a pretty advanced uh, thing that we can do, um, and because of that, unlike Google, where you sort of put words in, it automatically figures out what the words split on. Hyperstrayer enables you to make exceedingly complex queries. So by default, everything is a phrase, and as you can tell, I need to document this better because I didn't tell you that at all on this page. Um, and so if somebody wants to do that for me, that would be really great. Um, but anyway, we can search, for example, for LP0 on fire. A classic error message. Um, and so there are four hits in the BTS, which actually indicate people's quote pages, which talk about the LP0 being on fire. So uh, apparently no actual uh, error messages involving it uh, in bugs. Uh, and the links here work, of course. This actually goes to the bug report. OK, that's, that's sort of exciting. Let's look for something else more interesting. So let's look for memory. Oh, maybe I already had it here. No. Ah, we can go search for memory leaks. So leak and memory. So this looks for leak and memory in the same search request. And so we get 2,000 some odd requests. Uh, we want to do the classic complaint. We're going to add an attribute. And we want to look for a package. Um, this is suboptimal here, but I package that includes, since the package is a string. And we want to look at Ice Weasel. Classic complaint that Ice Weasel is leaking memory. So we just click search again. It takes a little bit longer because it has to go through and check with this attribute. But assuming that Merkel is still standing, it'll return eventually with the results. At least it was earlier. Yes? Uh, in the meantime, uh, is that uh, search interface linked uh, uh, yes, on the homepage? Yes, it's linked from the front page. Okay. Yeah. Was I missed it? Oh, there it goes. So there are 10 hits uh, for Ice Weasel leaking memory uh, that you can see. And so this is uh, slightly useful because it will enable you to uh, put in error strings and stuff and find bug reports that have it. Google is also now indexing the BTS. Um, so that is another option as well if this is slow or not working for whatever reason. Um, 
So that, that's something that's maybe useful. Um, another thing that's useful is that's recently changed um, are the CGI options now work again. Um, so this means that you can do relatively complex queries without having to know precisely what set of things you have to type into the URL. Uh, all these things can be done if you know all the URL options, but almost nobody does. So uh, let's do a, a couple examples here. So what did I say was the first one? So first, let me look for bugs which are in dev pegs, dev bugs which aren't tagged pending or won't fix, which happen to be owned by me. Okay, so first we'll search for bugs and debugs. So there's our bugs and debugs. Go all the way down to the bottom here. Oops. Oh, that was good. Okay. So we have bugs and debugs. And we want to exclude bugs which are tagged pending. Okay, that's good. Fortunately, currently you have to go through the submission process every time, but also want to exclude those that are tagged won't fix. Okay, so we've sort of drilled down the bugs a bit. Oops. And I only want to look at those bugs which are owned by me as well. And so, just like that, we've drilled down to a small set of bugs. So that's an example of the different things that you can use with these options. You can see that the URL that we're using has gotten quite a bit more complex than we started out. We started with just package equals dev bugs, and it's done all of this. If you ever get a URL that somebody sends you, it also is smart enough to be able to populate this by itself. So it can do all that. Um, you can exclude bugs with just about anything. If there's more things that you want to exclude, let me know. You can file bugs asking for them. You can also include bugs. So this on would only include bugs. Um, Oh, I should also point out, too, that if you s add additional things in here, for example, if I wanted to look in bugs which were in either debbugs or bugs.debian.org, which were owned by me but weren't tag pending or won't fix, you can just add an additional package here. So, for example, bugs.debian.org. Oops, helps if I spell correctly. And so this is, and it tells you what it's searching for at the top. This is bugs in package debugs or bugs.debian.org, which are owned by me, uh, shown as if they were in unstable. And, th and that's what it shows up. And so do play around with these options. You can do quite a lot there. Um, most people don't really use them uh, to their full potential. And if you have ideas about things that we should change for that, let me know. So we have about 12 minutes left here. So we're getting to the end. Um, so what's next for the BTS? These are the major things that I'm thinking about doing. Obviously, I currently have something like 150 or so some odd open bugs against dev bugs and bugs.debian.org. So there's a, a massive number of things on the to-do list. But these are some of the things that I think are more interesting. So the first one I sort of talked about, which was control commands in submit and uh, messages to a bug number. Um, and so this is something that is all the groundwork for it is done. Uh, it basically needs me to sit down and start rewriting process, which will take a while, but probably in the next couple months you'll see an announcement with this. Um, the, 
the other major thing that was brought out by the um, uh, earlier BOF, uh, which we talked about people drowning in bugs, is trying to order bugs by action item so that you can figure out which bugs require an action. So when you're a maintainer or a bug triager or somebody looking at the list of bugs, there's a way for you to order the bugs in packages or whatever that you're interested in in such a way that immediately at the top you see the next bug that needs something done to it. So you don't spend your time trolling through the list of bugs trying to figure out which bug. Because honestly, in a lot of times, that takes just as long to find a bug that you need to do something with as it does to actually do an action, like send a mail about a bug. Um, and so that's something that needs to be fixed. Um, I, I'm still thinking more and more about how to actually identify the bugs that require actions. So I'll open a bug against that bug shortly uh, with my initial thoughts on the matter. And if um, that's something that you're interested in or you have ideas on what bugs are important for you to respond to, um, that would be helpful so that I, I make sure that this is as flexible, uh, but at least initially covers as much of the common use case as possible. Um, another thing that needs to be changed is we need to keep state on the package report page and a couple other pages using cookies. There are a lot of people who like to be able to view um, package report with everything expanded by default. Um, and so I want to be able to ha have them when they click that, until they click the expand everything option, it stays expanded for them uh, by default. Uh, if you're not using JavaScript, it's expanded by default because uh, there's no way for you to toggle it on or off, so that's just the way we keep it. Um, but that's something that needs to be done. Um, I, I also want to use cookies in a couple other ways to try to make sure that when it's possible, the view of a page that you are looking at is the page that you come back to, um, so that if you spent your time to set things up, you can return to it. Um, if somebody else is really good at JavaScript, I would love it if somebody would uh, enable um, a tabular display using like jQuery or something, where you can actually select which columns you want to see from the bug report, and immediately in this table, uh, order by different things. So if you want to order by bug number, or by severity, or what needs to be done, and filter out on this table as well. Um, and so uh, just in a small table like that, um, it would enable you to really easily sort your bugs and drill them down uh, in a much better way. Um, instead of having like we have now, where if you have a large number of bugs, you have to go through three or four pages of bugs. This would enable you to have a small page of the bugs that you are currently interested in um, and to change that rapidly. Uh, the other thing that we're working on, um, and which a lot of work has been done on BTS Link, uh, not by me, thankfully, um, but uh, Lars and uh, Christina, a couple of us, have been talking about um, ways of better integrating with upstream bug trackers and also bug trackers and other distributions. Um, so it would be really nice if upstream was able to export in a common format that um, multiple bug trackers supported that provided information as to what the state of the upstream bug was immediately available. And we could also see, for example, what the state of the equivalent bug was in SUSE or Ubuntu or Red Hat or I don't know, whatever all other distributions you were interested in. So that if someone had managed to fix this bug that happened to be forwarded to you, it would be immediately apparent by anybody viewing that bug on the page because the BTS would know exactly what was going on. And you could go ahead and say, ah, yes, Fedora has fixed this. Let me go find their patch and import it, or at least communicate, at least be aware of that fact. Um, the other thing that this would enable us to do is if in addition to exporting state, it also enabled us to export the conversations about the bug, especially upstream. In a single page about the bug in Debian, you'd be able to see exactly what was going on in the upstream bug tracker about the bug. Um, so you'd have an idea if something else needed to be said about it. Um, so, so this is sort of a uh, pipe dream, as it were, but um, it's something that we're interested in, at least trying to lay the groundwork on as many major bug trackers as we can. So with that, I am open for questions. Uh, I have to, of course, thank the rest of the DevBugs team, a lot of people who have done a lot of work besides myself. Um, so with that, uh, I'm available for questions.
for suggestions. There is a few questions on the ERC channel. Mm -hmm. um, the first one is from MRBN. I don't know who is he. Uh, can you make it possible to select a users in the web interface and show that users user tag uh, and a way to see all the user tags attached to a package or a bag number? Okay. Um, so, yeah, that is something that I've actually been thinking about, um, is currently in the CGI options, there's no way to show which users are available to look at a particular view. Um, and so that's something that needs to be thought about. Um, one of the things that's also sort of in there is some people would prefer it if their user tags were, uh, I mean, uh, user tags are necessarily a personal view of the world. Um, and so it, it may be a question Obviously, they're already available to all developers, um, and they actually are publicly available if you know where to look as well. Um, but it may be something that people want to, by default, not be shown. Um, so that's something that I need to think about a little bit, but it's definitely uh, an idea that uh, I think there's already a bug filed about it, but if not, I I'm aware of it and it's something that needs to be changed. Okay, the, the next question is from Marga. Let me see. Well, uh, in the middle, my, my question is, um, there is any way for the future to implement syndication or, or RSS for the bugs and for the search? Yes. Um, so it, it would be possible. Um, the main concern that I had originally and why I had never really gone deep into implementing RSS uh, is primarily because uh, I didn't want RSS feeds banging away on the BTS constantly all the time. Um, so, uh, however, most of the bug pages, at least, now do uh, appropriate things with last modified so that they know whether to uh, short circuit a request. And it's not so for package report, but at least package report now and the whole uh, web facing part of the BTS is now spread over three machines. And so it can trivial, relatively trivially be spread over more as we have uh, hardware resources and the need for more machines. Um, so it's something that I, I can it, now again contemplate doing. Because at least if somebody is banging away at the RSS feeds, it won't uh, cause everything else to fail. I see. What? That's all right. Maybe you can use Java or something like this. <laughs> Jabber. Oh, jab Jabber to to uh, if you have new uh, messages or something you have to send it oh yeah but um, i mean anybody who wants can cons consume the feed so i mean if people want it in jabber or they want it in um, irc or whatever they can write those adapters uh, there's no way i'd have time to do that so th that's something that once i get in an exportable format from rss or from xml that's oriented by timestamp somebody else can do the transform to do that pretty trivially okay the question from marca in, in irc is how far are we from uh, being able to apply actions through SOAP, it's OAP, sorry, and how will, um, how will that work regarding authentication? Okay, so one of the issues uh, with that is that currently there's a lot of locking involved. Um, and so a lot of the code has all the locks in place, but it assumes that it's the only writer uh, and there are relatively big locks that make it extremely difficult to implement uh, a case where you have a lot of writers who are non-synchronous. Um, but with the abstraction of control, at least for some operations, if you're okay with a little bit of lock competition, would be a possibility of at least starting to think about. Um, so, I mean, if it's just me working on it, we're a long way away because that means I have to do it. Um, but if other people come in and help, then we can be uh, going a lot faster. But at least the groundwork is laid towards going to that position. Um, as far as authentication goes, uh, that's always been one of the issues. Of course, currently we don't require authentication at all for the BTS. Um, so uh, the main question there is just avoiding abuse. And it might be a case of having open ID from a set number of providers or requiring GPG sign messages or something like that. Some way of associating yourself uh, with the BTS so we at least sort of knew who it was coming from. 
So we have two minutes left, so just a couple more questions. Yeah. So uh, currently the BTS has a knowledge of whether a patch is or is not attached to a bug, but it has no knowledge on where is the patch. In a sense, it, it is not able to identify the patch. Mm -hmm. So have you ever thought about making that support on the server side? Because that would enable a couple of cool things. One is automatically downloading the patch, and the other one is marking a patch as obsolete by another version of the patch which gets posted afterwards. So yeah, I haven't thought about that, but that is something that would be useful to say. Um, is specifically which message encodes the fix. So please file a wishless bug against dead bugs for that, because otherwise I won't remember. <laughs> that, with patch, yes, if, if possible. <laughs> no. Any other questions or comments? Uh, so, I mean, I'll plea again, but if you're at all interested in how dead bugs works, uh, please feel free to join in. Our code is available on VDSR. Um, if you have any questions, you can ask me in Pound Dead Bugs on uh, OFTC or in any channel that I'm in. I'm Don Del Caro on most of the networks. So uh, feel free to ask questions and jump in and help out. All right, thanks for your attention. <laughs>